Hello guys, I would like to welcome you on our very first special event uh, related to data, machine learning, and uh, artificial intelligence in general. So, uh, let's get started. Uh, before diving into those so prominent lighting talks, uh, I would like to give you some context of uh, our department, what kind of project we do. So, uh, uh, you know, all, all of those talks, all of those lighting talks, are uh, really related to the project we are working on or we used to work in the past. And uh, uh, we will demonstrate uh, those, uh, those topics presented here uh, uh, on those projects. So, uh, before going any further, uh, I would like to introduce uh, STRV because uh, STRV uh, right now is not uh, really well known in the uh, data science community. So uh, here are some just basic facts about our company. Uh, that uh, we work uh, with, uh, uh, that uh, we are software design and engineering uh, company. Uh, we earn trust of industry and uh, we work uh, for uh, many interesting clients like Porsche, uh, Barnes & Noble, Minted, uh, Paris, Mad Men, uh, Athletic, and more. Uh, you might not know those brands well because uh, except the first one, all of these are US based. So uh, these are uh, really well known brands on the US market and actually uh, the fact that uh, almost all of these are US based can give you a hint of what kind of clients, what kind of uh, market we are focusing on, and uh, it's a US market. Uh, the company has uh, been uh, here since 2014. <laughs> 2004, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, we actually really like changes. Maybe Luca. Uh, let's uh, show show the t-shirt actually like uh, zero <laughs> one even. Uh, it's not that one uh, with the gray and uh, strong. So yeah, I I missed. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I thought that the different t-shirt with uh, brave uh, logo. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, uh, our core principles. Uh, is uh, to build something exceptional. Uh, we, as I said, we really like uh, taking uh, challenges and we want to do top work and we do the top work and that's the reason why those clients are choosing us over other agencies, other companies. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, let's... Uh, Let's uh, see SDRV uh, by numbers. Sorry. This one. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let's see SDRV by the numbers. So, as I said, uh, we have been uh, on the market since 2004. Uh, very interesting uh, are those uh, two last ratings, especially when it comes uh, to employee satisfaction, closed door. So, it's 4.8 out of 5. And uh, when it comes to business, uh, clock ranking right, is also uh, astonishing. Uh, we actually earn a few prizes when it comes to uh, clutch uh, reviews and ratings. And uh, we are really strict uh, when it comes uh, to selecting uh, new people, new employees, and also uh, you know, just uh, just just to see, just to illustrate what I was talking about about those uh, exceptional project uh, top work. Uh, actually, 40, 44 percent of our clients or our projects are referrals. So uh, these are the, uh, basically more 44 percent of our new clients are referred to us because, you know, the past clients uh, were uh, satisfied with our work. Uh, so, as I said, we are a design, uh, design and engineering company, and uh, there, are, there are a few platforms for design, front-end and mobile, 
different backend and uh, the latest addition to the team, uh, to the team uh, about data science. And we have established the department uh, in uh, 2020, so it's quite recent. But we are going quite strong. So uh, the the goal of this department was to start with the ten golden principles that apply to the whole company. Uh, we are uh, the we are a team of strong individuals uh, who like to apply the most relevant technologies uh, to solve exciting business cases and uh, bring uh, solutions that have a huge impact and bring uh, uh, value. Uh, yeah, and uh, we have been uh, very successful so far and uh, we think the, the way how we approach problems, uh, data, pro data related problems, uh, the way how we solve them, it might be also relevant for you, for the community. Therefore, uh, we prepare this talk the lighting talk uh, to you know uh, to share uh, because sharing is caring, right? So uh, yeah, just just a just a quick uh, intro. So basically, uh, this one is, this project is uh, related to our first talk. Uh, Lukas is going to give uh, about uh, sourcing data, and uh, he will tell you more once uh, he. Uh, once uh, you, it will be his turn. So uh, for one of our clients, uh, we are uh, trying to solve, we are trying to basically uh, uh, classify predict uh, what kind of condition a uh, collectible car is. And it's a really interesting problem for a, a really a huge market. And uh, our client's ambition is actually to replace the human reviewers because those, those grades are uh, assigned by uh, human reviewers and it's uh, really, uh, really expensive and long taking process. Uh, another, another thing is uh, helping with audio creation for companies Conclip, which recently raised uh, like a quarter of a billion dollars for their uh, for their solution and what we do uh, we help them to create their vast library of audio content uh, because it used to be done manually but you know this doesn't scale and this is like perfect case for a uh, machine learning solution uh, which can augment the team uh, and automate most of the manual work. Uh, this one uh, will be related to the second talk. Uh, representational learning because it's uh, yeah. Uh, another one is uh, video suggestions for Cinemon, so you can think of some uh, recommendation engine uh, uh, recommending relevant and novel video content to users. Uh, and the goal is to predict similarity between video content. So that's another project of ours. And the last one is uh, handwritten address recognition. Uh, and what is uh, really interesting about this one, so uh, the model is supposed to run on the user device. The inference is done uh, uh, on a mobile phone, not uh, at on, in cloud or you know, somewhere else. Okay, so uh, I will just pass the mic to uh, Bill Gash, uh, do not hesitate to ask questions at the end of the, each talk, and uh, after the session, you can approach any any one of us, and you know have a have a chat networking session with us, or you know you can just DM us uh, on social media, and yeah, that's basically it. Maybe the last message is that we are hiring. Hello everyone, my name is Lukasz Kulski and I'm a machine learning engineer here at STRE. So my talk uh, is in this uh, data sourcing. So what will it be about? 
So I would like to tell you a little bit about the project you were working on a few months ago, as, as Jan already mentioned. And uh, yeah, this project uh, seems like a uh, you know, quick and easy, quick and easy data sourcing uh, uh, start. But in the end, like 80 or 90 percent of time we spent on the project was uh, was actually uh, data sourcing and. It was, it was quite bad. We made a few mistakes, but we, we learned from them and we like to share with you uh, some lessons learned that may uh, help you in your future projects, maybe to not repeat our mistakes and, and be prepared for some, some unforeseen consequences. So, yeah, let's get to it. Uh, first of all, a uh, little, little background uh, about the project. So, maybe you have been collecting uh, sports cards now in the primary school, uh, hockey cards. And today it's it's like $14 billion business. It's, it's quite quite big. And if you want to sell your, your precious cards, you can have them graded. And to grade your card, you have to send it to some grading company and pay them like $30, usually more, and then wait 12 months, stop. Uh, or you can pay more and get your cards sooner. But no, it, it takes a long time and uh, who wants to wait a whole year to get their card graded. So let's build a machine learning card grader. Uh, it, it seems like a pretty straightforward project. Uh, find graded cards online. eBay is full of them. Uh, create data set with cards. Uh, train a model and, and we're done. Pretty easy, right? And no, it, it was not easy. and and. We made some mistakes, but yeah, but let's talk, let's talk about let's talk about those mistakes. So yeah, here you can see uh, some some graded cards. I have two, two cards with air diagram here. And uh, before we start with the project, we did some or some estimation how long uh, the project should take. We find a few few images uh, of the cards, like the one one on the left. It, it seems like a pretty easy data to work with. Uh, you know, to, to get the card out of it, to get the grading, you can see uh, at the top that this one is a 10. And yeah, it, seems, it seems quite easy. And after after seeing a few, few images like this, we were pretty confident that the, that the data sourcing would not take much time. But yeah, in the end, when we start working on the project, it changed drastically. Because most of the images were like this one on the right. Or worse, it is actually actually quite a good example or from what, what we've seen. And um, the images were very low resolution, very bad quality. Uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, glances, a lot of uh, light uh, light problems, and wrong descriptions from from the from the sellers. So we couldn't rely on what people wrote about the cards. So. We we hit a wall already here. And just FYI, the, the card on the left with the great ten is, is now costing a uh, hundred thousand dollars and the one on the right with uh, with grade seven costs sixty dollars. Just to get you reference what, what the grading company can do with the value of the card. And yeah, so the lessons learned here don't be fooled by a few data samples. This is a mistake that uh, that you can make, also like we did, and uh, yeah, really try to do uh, as much uh, data discovery as you can before you you start working on the project, and try to try to find as much data data as you want, plot everything you can, look at the data from all different angles, and if you are building new data set like we did, try to find as many sources as possible because uh, we we also needed to look into other sources uh, other than eBay. Uh, it was a pretty uh, long-term process and yeah, it cost us a lot of time. And uh, just a note here from the top Keglers, from the from the Kegler Masters, uh, they say that uh, they spent more than 50% of their time just looking at the data. They many times say just looking at it, just to, to get a feel of what, what the data are and to, to understand them better. Uh, okay, so but yeah, in the end we had some data and we need to pre-process them so we can work with them. And uh, again, we thought yeah, that this should be easy. Some thresholding, some ransack, and we will be able to to get the card out of the image. 
supposed in R to get the, to get the number, the, to get the great number. And yeah, it should, should be a few days. Uh, no, no, it was it was much more time. It was a few weeks actually. And uh, we had to we had to in the end after some failed attempts to, to get the cards with some easier process we need to implement an annotation tool uh, like you see here on, on the image uh, to find all the corners of the of the card and annotate cards on the images we need to manually annotate all the cards we need to uh, implement uh, a neural network we need to train it we need to implement OCR to to read the gradings. And all these systems take a lot, a lot of time and a lot of work. So, yeah, the lesson learned number two here is pre-processing can be another machine learning task. So sometimes your pre-processing can be just like filtering your database, uh, removing few few rows from the from the database, and it's it's quite quite straightforward. And you would probably spend um, not much time here, but Sometimes it can be a really tough process, even even more difficult than the the task you were supposed to solve in the, in the beginning. You know, Yamali can tell you a lot about it but later if you ask him uh, if, about the handwritten OCR because pre-processing there took so oh, so much time and so, so, so much so much power. Okay, so uh, let's get further. So we have a data set. Now we finally can learn something. We can train the machine learning model. So we did, and we we trained a great model with the great numbers. Everything looked great, actually too great. And so we started to look into it a little bit closer, and we find out that uh, our model was not actually learning uh, how to grade the cards to find you know bad corners, bad edges, or some surface issues. It was actually learning. Uh, what the cards uh, look like because the new cards like here on the right uh, from the 2020 look drastically different than all cards from 1980s 90s or even older and usually the older cards have uh, lower scores lower grading the newer cards has uh, higher grading so basically the the model just learned how to how to differentiate the era where, where the cards were were made so not really a good data set the lesson number three here is be aware of a bad validation data set or we can stretch out the validation be aware of your data set because even if you feel like your data looks good once you create the data sets uh, you need to be special uh, especially care about it when you are creating a new data set uh, from from your own sourcing and uh, that your data set is balanced uh, from all different features that uh, you know mm -hmm. you are really really have uh, balanced data and yeah, this is another another huge error we made and spent a lot of time then fixing the data set and just trying to get let's say a card from one era to, to make sure that we are grading uh, actually the, the card not not the time it was made and then the last uh, lesson learned is the problem forward, not solution backwards. It, it's a nice, nice, uh, nice thing. And what it means is that uh, again, at the beginning, we had some estimation, and so we thought, yeah, a few machine learning tricks or a few machine learning practices will solve like ninety percent of our problems, and it will be quite straightforward. But uh, it wasn't, and it, it was uh, mostly my fault because I thought like I used the same techniques over and over, so they should work here, of course, if they work on other problems. But it, it's something we, we I, I think we all do that once we are familiar with some tool or with some framework, some algorithm or something, we had a lot of success on previous problems. We tend to use the same same techniques, same algorithms, same framework to other problems. And yeah, one time it may not work as, as, as we would like to. So it's really good to take a step back, you know, wait, uh, think for a minute about it and, and really, really find out if you are really solving the problem or do you, do you already have your solution in your head, your, your, your algorithm, your network, and you just try to some 
push the problem onto, onto your already solved problem. Uh, okay, so we are at the end, and just a little bit uh, of a recap of what, what I talked here. So don't be fooled by the big data samples. Always, always do proper data analysis. Uh, Pre-processing can be can be really difficult and can be a machine learning task of itself. So uh, if you do your your data analysis properly, you should be prepared for it. You should see some red flags and and be prepared that uh, pre-processing can be really tough. And always validate your data set, of course. And uh, you know, if something works, then it works uh, ten times before it doesn't automatically mean it will work for the eleventh time. And there's a, one last one last thing I didn't mention before: do a short data discovery phase, because this is something we do in SDRV on all the projects. Uh, we try to do short uh, discovery phase. Like it can be one week, it can be a few days, but if you if you spend some time uh, on the data, even before you start with the project, even before you estimate the project, it can save you a ton of time and it could, it could uh, you know, find you all the problems that you would have to solve. You would know that uh, there are some issues and that uh, you know, it will take much more time than you anticipated. Okay, so that's it for me. And uh, if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Hello, uh, I will to ask if your estimator was uh, estimating. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Uh, yeah, it was uh, based on the how is the quality of the card you know, actually. How uh, corners are sharp, how edges are sharp. If there are any surface uh, flaws or anything like this, it didn't. It had nothing to do with the player on or how rare the card is. It's like a different task we would like to also solve in the later. You know, just to find how valuable the card is. But this was just to find how. Uh, what kind of grade we would uh, put into cards to see if you know if it looks like a new card or if it's really bad cards in a bad condition. Thanks for the show. Um, have you tried on uh, like real cards? For example, you have some equipment and you collected broken player cards. Have you tried it on one of these? And what was the result? If you did so? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I tried it, and uh, this was quite interesting because when you when you look at the, the cards online for sale, they are usually grade seven, eight, nine, or ten. You don't find sixes or or below. And when you look uh, on the cards and on the on the way how the human graders grade those cards, seven is in my eyes perfect card. It has sharp edges, sharp corners. It looks almost perfect. But uh, the the human graders see. Some, some errors. So, uh, of course, my cards from, from primary school had rounded edges and, and they look bad, so they were always uh, low grades. <laughs> so, no value in them. Maybe you can try to answer one of those YouTube questions. So, Vlad uh, asked uh, us uh, why you can't write custom data augment augmentation function and use it. Why we can't write? Oh, okay. That seems like an interesting question. Uh, we did some some data augmentation, especially on the uh, on the card detector, uh, where we augmented as much, much data as we can to build strong uh, on detector. So yeah, we, we use this uh, a lot uh, lot in here, but uh, I'm not sure how. We could do, we could do some augmentations on the actual grading. Of course, we can we can introduce some artificial problems on the cards, like scratches or, or stuff like this. But the problem is that if we do some some artificial scratches or rounded corners or something, 
uh, we are not sure if uh, this this problem would lower the grade by one degree or by two or three. We are not sure about this. So this is why we why we rely on really data from the human graders where we were sure about the, the proper grades. Yeah, you need to be really careful with the data argumentation because Lukash mentioned you know, it can screw up uh, <laughs> screw up the cards in some unexpected way. Of course, we did some uh, light augmentation like flipping and uh, you know cropping and uh, those kind of stuff, which basically uh, don't screw up uh, the quality of the uh, card. But yeah, it's tricky. Huh. Anyone? Um. Actually, I have two questions. One, uh, you mentioned you had to label the card. What was the number of the cards you had to label it? You have to learn the model. That's one question. Another, I'm not sure if you can allow to answer, but you showed the cases where the card was actually taken basically as a flat picture. How did you manage actually to resolve the detail or did you just not use the card? If, if, if the picture from the eBay had a really poor quality. Yeah, so uh, in the end we had like a quarter million uh, pictures. And from this, let's say 60% were usable. So this is quite the amount we were working on. And yeah, we still had a lot of a lot of possible ways to, to improve uh, the amount of the cards. So while we will continue on this project, we will add more. And uh, the, the second question was... Uh, well, like how many had to, you, you had to lay the line up? Oh, on, on the on the data, yeah, yeah. labeled around thousand uh, thousand cards, and we tried some data augmentations. Like when you uh, when you uh, cut out one card, you can insert it into another, and then you can have you know many more many more uh, training samples. Well, there are also many uh, pre-trained segmentation models available, so you can also. And uh, for the image quality, we actually use a machine learning model to grade uh, image quality. So it was another way how to filter uh, the bad images. Uh, any other question? Okay. Uh, I would like to know what accuracy did you manage to Sure. Yeah, th th this is a tricky question because, as I said, we, we trained some model and it looked great. And the accuracy there was uh, actually the, the metric we were looking looking into most was uh, the mean uh, mean error, like how much our grades uh, uh, in, on average were differentiated from from the actual grade from the human graders. Uh, on this suspiciously uh, a good model, it was like uh, 0.4 and you know it already seems like a, a little bit off. So when we create a proper data set in just one era and a uh, few thousand images, we were on like a little under one, like 0 0.9. So it was not, not as good as we expected, to be honest, uh, but it was uh, six weeks and as, <laughs> as I said, the, the main issue was that we spent the most of time on sourcing data instead of uh, on learning the algorithms. Uh, so we want to focus more uh, on this now that we have a uh, proper data set to improve uh, the quality. Any other question? Okay, thank you for the talk. Okay, so um, thank you for listening. Actually, uh, just one, uh, one last thing. We actually like really like working on projects like that because uh, we learn a lot. We did with this project.
So yeah. Uh, need to uh, switch uh, to the another another part, another lighting talk uh, on your menu, and it's uh, representational learning. And I get this this one. Uh, for most of you, uh, already might uh, know a lot about this one. So let's start with a quote. So it's uh, one of uh, it's uh, taken for a narrow hit machine learning conference, and uh, it's one of those uh, defining paper for functional learning. So. Uh, We'll get uh, to the term uh, later in slides. And uh, this quote is actually motivation for this uh, for this keyword. So uh, human, so it's basically about humans and uh, comparison with uh, the deep learning, the typical way how it is done. So we as a human uh, uh, we need very little uh, provision when it comes uh, to learning new things. Like uh, we can easily generalize the concept GLF uh, from a single picture in a book. And uh, but on the other hand, you have uh, deep learning systems, and these uh, needs uh, thousands of examples to do uh, to perform the same task uh, uh, as well as human uh, do. And uh, it's actually a motivation for the topic. Uh, so uh, let me just illustrate the, uh, the need uh, by representation methods on uh, simple examples. So uh, if I ask you to divide uh, 210 by 6, it's really easy for you, right? Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, reply, uh, or you can do that almost instantly. But uh, what if I present you to do so in a Roman numeral representation? So, what if I ask you uh, to divide uh, 2010 in Roman by uh, 6 in Roman? In that case, you would have a really hard time to do so. Uh, probably how you would approach it is uh, to realize or to find out, you know, to use some dictionary to convert this number, uh, this number to that uh, 210 and uh, same goes for six and then uh, divide it. So you, as you can see, you know, just uh, just by uh, changing the representation, uh, the task uh, gets uh, way more harder. Uh, so uh, good representation can make the learning task easier. And actually, realizing this fact uh, help us on many projects of ours. Uh, and uh, yeah, because uh, with uh, better representation, we can, for example, use uh, your example to train a, train a model to classify, discriminate giraffes, cars, whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, so as I said, you know, you already know, uh, you already know uh, something about uh, about the topic. Because uh, when you train a feed forward network in a supervised learning fashion, uh, it uh, already kind of adapts, it already kind of performs uh, representational learning as it is demonstrated on the picture. Uh, you can think about the last layer, uh, and usually it is some linear classifier, uh, which is uh, using the representation uh, provided by the last uh, hidden layer this one, and uh, as it is illustrated on the picture, uh, this layer is learning some abstract concepts, and uh, it actually, every, every, every layer, every hidden layer, is actually trying to uh, learn some uh, good representation to solve the task. In this case, uh, it can be predicting or recognizing human faces, and uh, uh, you you already you already know that, and uh, with it, uh, with the last last hidden layer, you can already get a uh, good representation as a byproduct actually of uh, uh, training feed forward network in supervised fashion. Uh, yeah, and uh, it works. 
Uh, it's I would I would summarize it into concept of trunk learning and doing adaptation. Uh, then you uh, basically can uh, exploit uh, exploit what uh, has been learned on uh, uh, another domain, some similar domain, and you can exploit it to generalize well in other domain. So. Uh, I guess that most of you uh, use some uh, pre-trained uh, uh, deep learning model, neural nets, like uh, uh, mobile net, exception, uh, etc., etc., uh, which are usually trained on uh, image net data set, and then uh, you just uh, usually fine-tune it on, uh, on uh, your data set, which uh, uh, is which can usually be like levels of magnitude uh, uh, lower than the original image net data set. And uh, just the things uh, of those properties of the uh, learned representation. Uh, and as I said, you know, the it, basically the motivation, the idea behind it is that uh, some representation may be useful in both environments, in both settings. And uh, it works. In uh, most of the cases, it works, uh, but uh, it doesn't uh, explicitly impose any condition on the representation euro euro learning. So uh, the the last layer can actually might not meet uh, your properties. For example, uh, dimensionality, etc., etc. Uh, uh, actually, uh, another another interesting concept. Uh, which is uh, basically the team phase of transfer learning. And in this case, you might not be uh, aware of this done. It's not that well known as transfer learning and, use and fine tuning already pre trained model. Uh, it's uh, fusion learning, or one shot learning, or even zero shot learning. Uh, because uh, in practice, and it's uh, very often even our case. Uh, we don't have some similar environment, uh, like, you know, uh, some similar problem to ImageNet. We, for example, uh, have some uh, specific data sets, like, for example, uh, uh, music, music uh, creation. And uh, in that case, uh, we have a large amount of unlabeled training data and relatively little labeled training data. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, with uh, transfer learning, uh, it might work, but uh, it doesn't meet the client's uh, acceptance criteria. So in that case, uh, we usually resolve uh, to few shot future learning or one shot learning. And uh, in this case, the uh, goal is to learn representation to, uh, to learn representation that is able to separate underlying classes. Uh, underlying classes. And uh, here's just a simple example of constructive learning. These are uh, TME's neural network. And yeah, uh, you know, I know it's, uh, it's maybe uh, too, too condensed, too dense, but uh, as I said, you know, it's just an intro to the topic and you can uh, check out the resources later. And uh, in this case, you have uh, TME's neural network, so basically these uh, deep learning models are sharing weight, and uh, the task is to actually predict how the input images, uh, if they are similar or not. Uh, so uh, every every image uh, is represented by encoding, which is basically output of the uh, TME's network and uh, you compare it with uh, another images and compute a similarity. By this way, you can, uh, you can uh, for example, have a training pair like uh, 0 and 1, and uh, you, can, uh, you can then learn from the data that these uh, data are similar. So you, you would like to optimize the score uh, to go to 0. And uh, actually, it's a really effective way how to use uh, really few samples. Few samples to train a, to train a powerful uh, machine learning model. Uh, because uh, uh, it's, uh, you can create uh, a lot of 
a lot of training parts, a lot of training samples, uh, especially when you apply some augmentation techniques and so on. And uh, yeah, here's just a simple example of the as I told, as, uh, as I mentioned. So in this problem, uh, we have some like uh, emotion. Uh, data said uh, where the goal is uh, uh, to recognize emotion. It's really similar to this, but this time you have really a huge class imbalance for uh, content emotion. And uh, you know, it's really hard to, uh, uh, to learn a good uh, classifier for this one uh, with traditional approach, supervised learning. And uh, with this approach, it's uh, really simple with a few data to distinguish uh, this emotion quite well, as you can see. And uh, these are the resources uh, you can dive in. I definitely recommend the first one. Uh, it has uh, like a whole chapter dedicated to the topic. Okay, hey, do you have any question? Don't be shy. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, did you actually uh, get to use any of the zero talk or bunch of learning in practice or in one of your projects? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, for example, for uh, similarity, uh, a video content recommendation. So that was one of one of those projects I use uh, this uh, one or future learning and also uh, for uh, audio recognition because uh, there were too little data yeah and also i forgot that uh, these techniques uh, some of them are really uh, robust to noise so uh, that's another benefit uh, yeah so these were like two uh, two projects uh, that we actually work on and use uh, representational learning one or future learning you know Maybe similar question. Uh, are there any cases where you would not combine uh, using these uh, techniques? Yeah, definitely there are. You know, it takes uh, time to fine tune it, and especially if you have a lot of data, you know, it doesn't make sense, you know, to do future learning because you can uh, learn it in summarized fashion because you have a huge data set, or in many cases, like it was demonstrated uh, on, the, on the first example, you might uh, resort to transfer learning, like to use for a different training model. But uh, for for some of those data sets, especially the hard uh, missionary problem, then uh, those uh, transfer, then those pre-trained models are not very effective. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Do you have any questions on YouTube? Certainly no, no questions. Anyway. Okay. So, yeah. So let's dive in into another talk. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very, very, very much for being here tonight. I was supposed to be there with you tonight, but unfortunately, or maybe not so unfortunate for me, my plane to Prague was cancelled. So I'm basically still on holiday. However, because we think that the topic of online learning is very important, we still decided to go on with this presentation. It's my plan to give you a short introduction into online learning, give you an overview as an example, and describe how we think that online learning should be integrated into reality. So it's now time for an illustration of online learning and an illustration of the online learning framework for, say, for a situation where I think that the online learning framework is useful is email spam filtering. 
So in the context, email spam filtering, the system, the learner, has to classify emails as being spam or um, being valid. The system has to cope with a constant, so here the route, a constant inflow of adversarially generated data as the, spam, the generator of the spam is deliberately trying to fool the system. So in the online learning terminology, we call the center of the spam, spam source, the environment, and we say that the environment is adversarial because the center of the spam is trying to beat the learner, trying to beat the system and to get its spam through directly into the uh, email of the user. So adversarial and varying data requires a dynamic system, which is a homework on my learning. So again, we try to make their um, as little assumptions as possible because we assume that the um, the spam is going to change over time. So I hope that you guys are interested in the framework, the theoretical framework of online learning. I have chosen not to introduce the most general framework of online learning because I don't think that it's suitable for a short talk like this one. But instead, I will introduce you to something a bit more uh, specific. So for the people that are interested in, uh, in online learning, this framework is basically called OCO. It stands for Online Context Optimization, which can be seen as a special case of online learning. So OCO, or also online learning, is about the progression of events observed in nature. The learner or player, say you are the uh, you have the online learning, you are the, the learner in this case, and you want um, you must predict the next the next element in a potentially infinite sequence of elements. The learning is thus not executed at once, not instantly, but instead takes place in consecutive rounds. As you can see here, t is 1, 2, all the way up to capital T, which denotes the final round of the sequence. For every round t, the learner, you, predict vector wt. In I think in normal machine learning or in the theory or of let's say linear models, this um, vector is normally called something like um, W uh, beta. But in online learning, it's very often denoted as W. So that's why I also decided to denote it as W here. Then, consequently, the environment, because in online learning, you replay against an environment fulfills a loss function. The new the player suffered this loss with regard to the vector that you just predicted. So that is the, um, the basic, very simple uh, framework. And it's important to understand that we are close to normal machine learning approaches, but not quite. Because in online learning, we normally want to make or we normally don't want to make any assumptions on the loss or the learning in, um, in general. It's important to understand that we assume that things, or that we, that, that we think that things can change over time. We want to make as few assumptions on the learning as possible. We want a flexible model that can very easily adapt to new situations. We don't want to minimize the loss at once, as is very often done in traditional machine learning, but we minimize the loss over, over rounds. And we basically say that, okay, the loss function can change over time. And there could be a different loss in T is 100 compared to T is 10. So after the framework and the example, I can now illustrate an algorithm for, for online learning. For simplicity, I've chosen linear regression. And I will show you 
how my linear regression is derived from normal linear regression. By this, by this example, by this algorithm, is good for online learning. I'm sure that you have seen the expression on the slide before. It's just a least squared estimator used in linear regression. You can use this expression to derive an algorithm for online linear regression. And I'll show you how it's done. You can split the uh, estimator here in two parts, and then update these parts, A and B, on every round. It's done like this. I'm sure you, that you can see that you've just taken the least squared estimator to form two new expressions, A and B, where A is a matrix and B is a vector, and you can very easily update them on every round of new information. So for the algorithm, these are the only things that we need to keep in memory. And we update them after the new information on each round has become available. Finally, we calculate W like this. By just taking the inverse of A and multiplying it with B, as also done in the equation up there, which is the normal um, discrete estimator of a linear regression. The algorithm is very efficient, very fast, and as I said before, you only have to keep A and B in memory. So, concerning the data, there is no need to keep any of it in our memory. So, where do we think that online learning is useful? For example, in the context of the multi-arm pendants, which is a simplified version of reinforcement learning. In the multi-arm bandits, exploration and exploitation are balanced. They are um, they are they are mixed. This can be done in a very smart way in the algorithm I have just uh, shown to you. Secondly, also for recommendation engines, online learning is a very good choice because normally the data on it is um, is very big. And with online learning, we need to keep almost nothing in our main memory. And for fire environments, like I just show, like I just shown you with the um, email spam filter, online learning is also very useful. If you want to have some other, so some better or even non-linear relationship between the features and the outcome, you can also take some other model than linear regression. As far as I know. Neural networks and linear regression are the most common choices, but other options also um, exist and are definitely worth exploring. And I have included some references for you to um, to look up. I hope that you found my presentation interesting, and I also hope that you will find the time to do some more research in the very hot. And I'll stop talking in your free time. Thank you for listening and have fun with the other presentations. Do you have any questions? Yeah, maybe you might come to the theoretical ones. Uh, um, if that might be the right person to ask because it's. Uh, Closely related to his view of study. Mm -hmm. uh, you have any YouTube questions? Or... No? And audience? Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, I, I don't know much about this. But, uh, I was just looking at those equations. It looks similar to kind of uh, uh, rolling, uh, rolling this mean square uh, thingy. But uh, as I understood, the, the trick is not optimization of oncoming data only, but you are changing also the, the, the log function in, uh, in, in the step. I just didn't see that in the equation. It, there was an equation when you took the normal equation, you split it to the part A and B, and you made for each time step. But I never saw the place where you update the kind of this log function thing. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, just my
I mean, I think I call it love it to be. Uh, you know, the, this one is closely related to reinforcement learning. So uh, you can have some, um, you know, simple equation with some uh, discounting factor to actually update uh, the function, the function. Uh, yeah, but other than that, I'm definitely not the kind of specialist. Uh, sorry. Maybe uh, you can just reach out, send us an email, and once the link is back, we will forward the message. And okay, uh, actually for that topic, I would recommend the Hutton book uh, on reinforcement learning, right? And uh, yeah, modern bandits are maybe like the intro chapter or something like that. So yeah. Any other question? Okay, so then uh, let's pass the mic. Okay. Is there any other interesting project other than the recommendation where you use some of them? Right now, it's just the uh, recommendation engines. But uh, we actually do experiment uh, on some prototypes. Uh, uh, with recommendation learning and sorry, uh, with multi arm bandit online learning and active learning, and this one is related to fraud detection. But yeah, it's just a prototype. Any other one? Okay, Michael, now it's your turn. Yeah, thanks. I think. I need to unlock the app. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak here. Uh, my name is uh, Michal Schuster, and I'm a PhD student at the Czech Technical University. I'm sure all of you are uh, pretty hungry and thirsty, so I will keep my presentation short. I will talk about uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, but before I get to that, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do at uh, the game theory group that's on. Um, so uh, we are interested in imperfect information games. These are games where players don't have knowledge about everything that's going on in the game and they only perceive some partial observations. So you can think uh, like a typical game like this is poker, where the players uh, do not know uh, the cards of their opponents, but still they would like to play as well as possible against a worst case adversary. So poker is a game that has been solved. And uh, now uh, we are interested in uh, pushing the boundary and solving uh, more challenging, more difficult games. Uh, this is an example of a game which is uh, much more difficult than poker. Uh, this, is called, uh, this is, uh, is it working? Yeah, I don't think you can see it. I'll just point with my hand. Okay, so this is a dark chess. It's a variant of chess where the players uh, do not see the entire board, but they can see only the the squares where they can in other pieces. And uh, the players have uh, common knowledge only if uh, there's uh, pieces which are mutually attacking. So you can see there's the, uh, there's the two pawns. And if you want to play such a game, you actually need a third party, you need a referee that has uh, a knowledge of how the board actually looks like and sends messages to each player. They, it sends the, the observations uh, to these players uh, because they don't know exactly what's going on in the game. And uh, when I'm talking about this, um, we launched a comp competition and this competition is open to all participants of any background. Uh, you can find it on 
uh, higcompetition.info. HIG stands for Hidden Information Games Competition. It's organized by uh, Czech, Te Czech Technical University, DeepMind, and Facebook AI Research. And uh, basically, we're trying to push the boundary uh, to uh, solve these imperfect information games similarly to uh, Alpha Zero, uh, it much solved perfect information games. So that's for the advertisement. And now uh, to the lecture. So I have uh, some uh, pictures of people here. And I'd like to ask you uh, which of the, these people do you think is uh, fake and which is real? Can I yeah, get some answers maybe? Yes? All of them are fake. Nice. <laughs> it was a trick question. Yes, all of them are fake. Uh, I was hoping, like, oh, maybe that's not. <laughs> the smart crowd. <laughs> okay, yes, all of them are fake. And uh, uh, all of these pictures were generated with uh, GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, these are neural networks, or like a setup of neural networks uh, that are great uh, as a general method for sampling high dimensional data points. So, what that means is that you can have like pictures of people or cats, or it doesn't have to be only pictures, it can be any real kind of data. And uh, specifically, these are high fidelity, like high resolution uh, photo uh, pictures. 2024 by 2024 pixels uh, generated using uh, StyleGen2 by, by NVIDIA. You can actually try it for yourself on your phone. Just type in this person does not exist.com and it will keep generating new and new pictures of people as you refresh. So, uh, just this was just a intro, uh, but like, why should we be interested in GANs? Like, okay, like besides generating fake pictures or doing some kinds of uh, nasty business, uh, some uh, applications of GANs uh, uh, are in the generation of synthetic training data for machine learning models. In case the training data is insufficient or collecting it is too costly. Um, this comes with the caveat, like this is not a panacea, like uh, you can't expect to get uh, millions of images out of a single picture, but uh, in some cases this, this can be a useful thing to do. Uh, then there are things like domain to domain translations, so image to image translations or text to image. So for example, you could have a canvas uh, one, one, of the, one of the papers I've seen is you have a canvas and you put out uh, sorts of regions on this canvas, like this is where a forest should be, this is where a lake should be, sort of like seg segmentation of, of the picture. And the GAN will um, fill in these regions with plausible looking uh, content, like a real lake, which has a reflection of the mountain to it and, and so on. And then uh, other use cases are denoising uh, images. Uh, if you have a, a low, low, lower quality or even higher, like um, on a mobile phone, you can you can get uh, sharper uh, sharper uh, photographs, uh, super resolution. So, for example, you can uh, send uh, compressed pictures over the internet and have a decoder locally on your phone or on your uh, uh, computer, which would uh, make a super resolution of this. So I think uh, this is something that's uh, been introduced uh, also recently with NVIDIA, where they're doing automatically super resolution on computer games as a advanced feature that's been announced. I'm not sure if it's actually out there with the new graphics. Maybe somebody can tell me. I just remember this. Okay. Anyway, uh, or predictions of the next frame in videos and so on. So uh, I would like to tell you a little bit uh, technical details about GANs. 
So what is the difference uh, between sort of like standard machine learning task and again training? So the standard task is that like, on a high level, you're optimizing a single objective. So the objective is typically that you have a loss function and you're trying to minimize the expected loss uh, uh, as uh, uh, on, on the uh, between the label and the predictions of your neural network over over the, the input uh, observations as images and so on and you have some access to a representative data set uh, which is drawn from a distribution that should correspond to like the real uh, images and the real labels and typically uh, the model that we have is a neural network that we find with uh, gradient descent. So um, one way to visualize this is a very, very, very simplified is uh, that uh, you have uh, some kind of a oval or uh, uh, con convex shape that uh, the gradient descent is taking steps and we're trying to find the minimum, which is uh, where you find the best possible neural network. Okay, so what about here? This is uh, more involved, but not too difficult. So the high level idea is, uh, I think this got lost, but there was something different before. Uh, so the high level idea is that you optimize multiple objectives and uh, the input is still um, some observations, some images, uh, but now you're uh, not so much interested in the labels. What you're really after is to be able to model the, the distribution of, of, these, uh, of these observations themselves. So for example, like, uh, you can take a camera and you can take a bunch of pictures and most of the pictures that you take look like the real world. They don't look like random noise, right? So there's a natural distribution of images that exist in the world around us. And uh, it is very difficult to model. It's very complicated. And uh, we can try to learn this distribution uh, through, through GAS. So besides uh, the images, uh, there is another thing, uh, a noise source. So what uh, this means is that um, uh, when we want to, or the idea for the, in the name is generative adversarial networks, is that we generate a new image. And there's actually two players that play a game. Uh, there's a so-called gen generator and a discriminator. And these two players are in this uh, where uh, the discriminator wants to distinguish uh, the synthetic and the real images as well as possible. Uh, and uh, the generator wants to pull the discriminator as, as much as possible. It's, so it cannot predict uh, whether the image is real or not. So what this corresponds to is that uh, we have this game of two players. Uh, there's some uh, loss function. I will not get too much into that, but basically it's a, it's a loss function that uh, combines uh, uh, the, the calculus the utility of uh, 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 of uh, the, the loss uh, for, for the generation and for the discrimination. And the, the task, uh, what it corresponds to is that uh, we're trying to find a saddle point uh, in this uh, uh, optimization task. So as before, we had this nice sort of looking surface. This is a vast simplification, okay? But now we're uh, actually trying to find a saddle point. So that means somewhere here where neither of the players can improve. So one of these players wants to move like sort of this direction. And then the other one wants to move in this direction. So there is like this battle, like, like should we go down or should we go up and so on. And uh, so uh, 
as I said, I'm uh, doing research in game theory, and GANs uh, are you know, can be treated as an instance of a game theory problem where there's these two players, there's this zero sum game between the discriminator and the generator, and uh, you can think of the neural networks that they correspond to player strategies as how to generate the images and the strategy as how to discriminate the image. And uh, in games, uh, there's this uh, solution concept called Nash Equilibria. Maybe you heard about this. And in zero sum games, the saddle points correspond to Nash Equilibria in the game. And there's some results about. Uh, uh, finding Nash equilibria in general. So uh, one, one of them I'd like to highlight is that the training of both players or the networks must be coupled because if we are uh, training the networks simultaneously, uh, uh, we have to sort of uh, condition the, the, the steps on, on the other networks, like they have to these steps have to be done simultaneously. They cannot be separated out. Okay. So, and that because there exists uh, no uncoupled dynamics, uh, which guarantee uh, converges to an actual equilibrium. And the second is that it is not enough to adapt to the opponent just by applying a simple gradient descent step for each neural network individually. Something that you would be doing. In the, in the standard task, because uh, these networks uh, may keep rotating around the saddle. So this is visualized here on this uh, face portrait as an example. Where basically, uh, the, each of the players can uh, adapt to, to the previous strategy and keep circling around the saddle point. So, so if uh, this was uh, a game like uh, People would play, for example, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, you can, uh, a player would, uh, like the, the, the networks are analogous to the players uh, choosing strategies like play rock, play paper, play scissors. And each step of learning is actually like, oh, look, let's take a look at what my opponent did last time. Like he played rock. Okay, now I'm going to play paper. And the other player is going to do the same, and because there is like this discrete response, like the players will just keep rotating and like changing the strategy one at a time. But uh, this is not actually a natural equilibrium of this game. Uh, that would be actually choosing each of these actions uh, uniformly, uh, randomly, not not based on a historical sequence where you keep changing it one at a time in a predictable way. So, uh, yeah, there's more to say about this. Sorry, can I go back? Oh, okay. Somehow it did not. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah. So uh, to conclude about this, like uh, the results that we have with uh, generative, generative adversarial networks are quite impressive, but these networks are quite difficult to train in practice uh, because there is these issues with the dynamics and the non-convergence. Uh, these actually show up in practice, uh, like the, the, the point that I was saying, the second point is mold collapse. So for example, you will be training generative adversarial network on a range of images, uh, which uh, may include objects such as cats, dogs, and horses, and your network will be only generating cats at the time, then it will switch to doing dogs at the time and horses. It, it will not be generating uh, from each class um, uh, equally. Yeah, like it, it will be concentrating uh, all, all of the generation on each of that particular class. So that's called mode collapse. And that's uh, similar to how I was talking about the sort of rock, paper, scissors dynamics, where you would concentrate only on one. Okay, and so for a very short literature over review, uh, GANs are actually also hard in theory that was recently proved by Mr. Daskalakis. He had a really nice uh, lecture 
at uh, AAAI uh, workshop on uh, reinforcement learning and games. Unfortunately, that lecture was not recorded. I couldn't find like a video of it. Uh, but uh, the, there is a paper. It's not, uh, not that the lecture was much more understandable. But the point of the whole thing is that if you um, uh, try to train neural networks, which are in general uh, non-convex, non-concave function functions, it's very hard to just even get uh, an approximation uh, of these other points. And there's all kinds of uh, analyses and number of practical tricks that people do to actually produce the results that I was showing you here. And yeah, so that's that's it from me. Thank you. So I would ask Hamza to conclude, I guess. Uh, maybe uh, for his questions, yeah, you can forward one slide, Matt. Maybe we can, yeah. <laughs> one day. <laughs> ah, that's <laughs> like, there's no time for questions. Okay, I'm sure you're hungry. But no, uh, feel, feel free. Yeah, 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 feel free to ask. Do you have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. So when you, when you say that it's hard to find seven points, you mean that there is no guarantee to find the end, not having those functions starting from the point? Yeah, so uh, to come back to the exact statement. So uh, the, the, in, like from theoretical point of view, it is uh, get, getting large enough approximation is difficult. So uh, you might need exponential time of training to get a uh, specific approximation error. Nonetheless, people have, you know, there's theory and practice, right? And uh, people have been playing around with GANs and uh, trying all sorts of tricks to make it work. And uh, I would claim that these are pretty impressive images, you know, given the like what it's actually doing. Like the the setup is quite simple, right? and these are very high dimensional points. And uh, when I was um, trying to distinguish, because there's also a website like where you can click if it's a fake or real person, and the way how I did go about distinguishing them is not by the face but by the background, because the background was all in a weird way, but the face was actually quite nice. Okay. Yeah, sure. Any other question? We have no. Okay. Maybe in that case, uh, we can conclude. Uh, let me just ask one more time. Uh, maybe uh, do you might have some general question to, you know, to any topic, something back, or, you know, some information about the department, whatever. Uh, so any, any other last questions? That no other question. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you for the attention. 